Hello, everyone, and welcome to NEPEC's COVID-19 webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about alternative care sites. My name is Amanda Grendel. I'm one of the faculty members for the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center, and I'm going to be your moderator today. Today, we have a really great lineup of speakers. We are really excited to talk to you about these alternative care sites. As we know, many of you are struggling, like us, within the U.S. of increasing numbers and capacity. So first, talking about how they use the pediatric ICU for adult care, we'll have Dr. Ryan Carroll and Kim Wallen. Next, we'll have a couple speakers from the Boston Hope Field Hospital, Dr. Stacy Hutton Johnson and Dr. Amy Botman. And then to close us out, we'll hear some experiences from colleagues in New York, Dr. Koi Long and Dr. Syra Madad. After that, like I mentioned, I'll come back on and we'll have some time for question and answers. And then we will go through some resources that NEPEC has to offer you. So a little bit about the National Emerging Special Pathogens Training and Education Center. Our mission is to increase the capability of the United States public health and healthcare systems to safely and effectively manage individuals with suspected or confirmed special pathogens. If you have not visited our website, it is very robust and is located at www.needtech.org. You can also email us at the same email address I just mentioned, info at needtech.org. NETEC has several branches within its organization. First, we have an assessment or consultation and metrics arm. This helps hospitals assess their readiness. It helps you measure your healthcare worker and facility readiness, and they will also be able to give you feedback. Prior to COVID, we were able to do these on-site assessments. Now we have moved to a more virtual platform. We also have an education arm that provides online trainings and in-person courses. Again, most of those have been turned virtual. We also do webinars like the ones we are doing today. Next, we have technical assistance. We can do that on-site or remote, and we have a very large repository of online tools and resources. We also have a lot of exercise templates that you can plug and play for your institution based on, based on the HSEAP model. And then we also have an emergency on-call. And last but not least, we do have a research network. Again, we have that online repository that has lots of research protocols on it. We help develop policies and procedures for data capture tools to help you facilitate research in your institution. And then we also have a specimen biorepository. All of these work together as well and support each other. So without further ado, we're gonna get started with our content today. First up, we're gonna be hearing from Mass General and transforming a pediatric ICU into a COVID-19 adult MICU and their lessons learned. I'm gonna let Dr. Carroll and Kim introduce themselves before they get started. Dr. Carroll? Thank you very much. This is Ryan Carroll. Um, thank you very much to, to everybody for joining us this afternoon and for NETEC for inviting us to take part in this important and poignant conversation. Um, I'm on faculty in the pediatric ICU at Mass General for Children um, and also the director for global pediatric critical care and also an active member in the BioThreats team. Kim? Hi, I'm Kim Whalen. I'm the nursing practice specialist in the PICU at Mass General and also part of the BioThreats team. So we felt that it would be important in this context of talking about uh, alternate sites to discuss uh, the, the experience that we had, which is a lot like others' experiences, of transforming a pediatric ICU uh, to meet the absolute uh, exponential rise in patients um, coming in, into our uh, hospital and to our uh, adult patients coming into our hospital. Just to put this in context, Massachusetts General Hospital is one of the larger hospitals in the region. It's a 999 bed hospital. It's also the region one referral hospital for emerging infectious diseases, um, special pathogens. Um, and at our peak, for instance, during the first surge, uh, to give an example, we had up to 200 ventilators running at a time um, and nearly all of our ECMO circuits were taken. We played a not insignificant role um, in, in that. And uh, to give it some context, our pediatric uh, ICU is a 14 bed unit. We take care of neonates up to 21 years of age. Uh, it's a mixed medical and surgical ICU and bronchiolitis, pneumonia, otolaryngology, trauma, sepsis are staples for us. We have full mechanical ventilation, uh, renal replacement therapy, and ECMO capabilities. And we are an active part of the regional treatment center for emerging special pathogens, as mentioned, for region one. 
And like a lot of PICUs, we are family centered and really parents play a very active role in rounds and decision making. Next slide. Just to give you a bit of context for our uh, the, the heft of the patients that we saw during the surge, um, we wanted to just do the go over our, an overview of the patients that were admitted to our PICU. So from April to June 2020, we admitted 37 critically ill adults, uh, the majority of whom were actually COVID-19 positive, of, of whom um, about 85% were intubated. Um, in that same context, interestingly enough, we took care of about nine COVID-19 negative or rule out patients or overflow, a quarter of which were intubated. Of the 28 COVID-19 positive patients, sort of the median PICU stay was 11 days. Uh, the majority were male and the majority identified as Hispanic Latin X as has been described in multiple other references. And comorbidities were fairly narrowed, if you will. The diabetes, hyperlipidemia, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension were uh, typically seen. Just to give a sense for the gravity of the situation, um, just to talk a little bit more using some ICU terminology here, um, our median lowest PF ratio or PAO2, FIO2 ratio, sort of a metric of oxygen uh, delivery um, within the lungs for our intubated patients was about 161, that's quite low. And the median peak positive end expiratory pressure, the PEEP that was used on the ventilators uh, was about 14, which is actually quite moderate and high. Um, about half the pay over half the patients underwent an optimal PEEP maneuver, and then half the patients were prone for a median of about three days, requiring a special prone team. Of the 15 patients that were extubated, three required reintubation, and tracheostomy were performed in 10 patients in total. 14% uh, of those patients of our patients required uh, renal replacement therapy, and we did have two mortalities. One was due to uh, overwhelming multi-organ dysfunction in a COVID-19 patient. And one was a patient who was not intubated, who was comfort measures only, who was a DNR, DNI, who received some pressors and some antibiotics, who was also COVID-19 um, positive. And so I, I just wanted to give an overview of the types of patients that we saw, and they're very commensurate with the other ICUs in our hospital, the traditional or legacy ICUs, our MICU and, PIC, uh, our MICU and SICU, our cardiac ICUs. Um, and that's, that's an overview of what we saw. And Kim will now go through what her team, the nursing team and what the physician team did together to prepare our team to take care of all those patients. Kim? Thanks, Ryan. So at the beginning of the, the first surge, there was a lot of uncertainty and fear among the PICU staff. Uh, there was fear around what would happen to our pediatric patients and what would happen to our PICU. Um, leadership knew that it was likely the PICU would be converted to an adult COVID unit and knew that we had to start preparing. Um, this was difficult because staff wanted to remain hopeful that we would remain pediatrics um, where leadership knew that we had to, you know, get things ready. So it was very, um, leadership was very transparent with the staff and made sure that they knew that the conversion to adults would be coming and we had to prepare. Um, when I read the study by Shanna Feltz and JAMA, it made me reflect on the PICU's journey during the first surge and the steps that we had to put in place to ensure that our staff were able to provide the best care possible for these adult patients. Um, this article, it highlighted the importance for leadership to create an environment that promotes safety and security. Staff want to be heard, protected, prepared, supported, and cared for. Um, leadership quickly had to look at all aspects of transitioning the PICU to an adult COVID unit. So first we had to look at our space. We had to convert some of our rooms over, which were positive pressure. Um, we had to convert those to neutral. We had to look at all our equipment and convert over to any adult equipment that we had to um, switch over to. A lot of our cables and um, monitors had to be switched. 
we had to look at our supplies. So basically we went up to the MICU and I felt like it was like a shopping list. We went into their supply room and said, we need that, that, that. You know, a lot of the things that we don't typically do in pediatrics, such as wound care, um, the adult transducers, CVVH, um, we had to increase all our supplies for that. And a lot of it too was a moving target, things that we didn't even know we needed. Um, we would need to get, which, you know, our materials team was great at helping us with that. We also had to convert, so we have our bedside carts in our rooms that has all our pediatric equipment, um, microtainers and blood drawing equipment for pediatrics. So we had to switch all that to an adult supplies. We also had to work with Epic and our IT team to switch over our um, our flow sheets. So we had to look at, so right now we're location-based. So any patient that's admitted to the PICU, we get our PICU pediatric flow sheets. Um, and so we had to switch that so that it was an age-based logic rather than um, a location-based. That way we were able to get all the correct adult flow sheets and scales that we needed to use. We, need to look, we needed to look at our monitors and work with Biomed and make sure that the parameters and the alarms were set appropriately for all the adult patients that we were getting. Uh, we had iPads that were placed in all the rooms for communication uh, with families and staff. Um, and the physicians used a platform for remote rounding. And then our pharmacy, we had to also, we have um, pediatric card, code carts in our unit. So we had to switch those out for adult code carts. We had to look at our OmniCell and look at our PAR levels of our OmniCell and increase any of the adult meds that we had or add them if we did not have them. Um, so quickly, you know, we had to do a lot of education for the staff. Um, and I think one of the difficult things was getting them ready to know that this was coming and that they really needed to do this education and not be in denial. Um, so quickly, we had to prepare resources to care for adult COVID patients and educate the team. One of the advantages the PICU had was our involvement with the bio threats team. We had staff who were very well versed in donning and doffing and became champions in the PICU and throughout the whole hospital. The relationship with the bio threats team gave the PICU a sense of comfort having experienced clinicians um, that have gone through these drills and were comfortable with this. Um, due to the bio threats team, the PICU also had an established collaboration working with the medical ICU team, which came in very handy with all of our adult COVID patients. Um, one of the things we realized is education and training is a moving target. Um, during the first surge, information was changing so frequently and it was important for leadership to have clear communication with the staff and to provide frequent updates and training. Constant communication was important to make sure everyone was updated and felt comfortable. Um, and leadership rapidly had to put together resources to help the team make this transition. So between the Department of Medicine, Critical Care and Nursing, there was um, a series of web web-based lectures that were put together on adult COVID and ICU topics. Uh, for the PICU nurses, we had to put together resources and education very quickly on adult dosing, um, adult dosing resources. We had to look at the adult code response. We had to familiarize ourselves with some of the adult equipment. Um, very quickly, we reviewed proning protocols and practiced that. Um, before these patients came to us. We reviewed the adult COVID and IC management algorithms. We had to educate on sedation and delirium documentation um, for PD uses different scales for those. So we wanted to make sure we were using the adult tools. Um, we had to review our adult EPIC documentation, our disaster documentation, um, and then one of the things too was that we, the staff that came into the PICU came from all different levels and I'll get into staffing next, but we, I, we had to create education for travelers, for ICU nurses, for pediatric nurses, for adult general care nurses, um, and make sure that everyone was on the same page and had the same tools. 
and then also orienting the PICU nurses to um, a new workflow with their team. So with our staffing, um, so we went from 14 patients with increased acuity. So we had to increase our staffing very quickly. And we did that with, we received, our PICU team stayed together in the PICU, um, but we received adult general care nurses, adult ICU travelers, PD general care nurses, PD travelers, um, and some nurse practitioners. One of the greatest things I think that happened for us is that we were partners with adult general care nurses. Um, the staffing approach was a two patient assignment that consisted of a PICU nurse and an adult general care nurse. The PICU nurses had the critical care knowledge and knew how to care for critical care adolescents. Um, and what we lacked was the adult nursing. And so the PICU nurses and the adult nurses worked together in a partnership and each nurse contributed to the care of these patients. And there was not, I think what formed such a nice team was that each nurse contributed something to the patient care. Um, and it really made the individual nurses feel valued and part of the team and improve the quality of care for these patients. Um, and then I'm gonna let Ryan just kind of jump in and talk about the physicians and what they did with their staffing. Yep, thanks. We uh, typically run in team and a single team for the 14 beds with pediatric residents, fellows and intensivists. Uh, the oversee rounds, et cetera, and working closely with the nursing staff and families. Um, of course, families were not part of this process, uh, but we'll get in, into that in a little bit. Um, but to augment our ability to take care of patients uh, of, a, of an age group that we typically don't, uh, MedPeds residents were pre-selected to work with us, and then medicine residents were also selected to work with us to help oversee some of those very specific adult-based uh, parameters uh, and, and uh, algorithms. Um, we also consulted with our MICU, Medicine ICU uh, colleagues, who basically rounded with us twice a day uh, to make sure that we were all on the same page and looking, uh, to, uh, looking at the pathophysiology in a similar context. Um, we, we were busy enough and it was hectic enough that we actually split the unit into two teams, so seven and seven. Um, and um, we also began in, in, to take call in-house. Um, there was a concern about liability protection and the state provided an overview of that. Um, and there was also support from internal uh, teams to expand our credentialing to care for adult uh, patients. Kim? Great, thanks, Ryan. Um, the other specialties, so a lot of work was done to try to decrease the amount of staff that was on campus. So there was many specialties that were working remotely, um, social work, um, little things, even like IT and the phone people. So this really, I mean, it was great to decrease the amount of staff on campus, but it really increased the workload for the people that were here, the nurses and the physicians that were in the room and having to troubleshoot um, you know, phones or work as social work and try to connect with the social workers remotely. Um, we also had an increase in staff that were around. So we had people that were deployed to us that were research assistants and they acted, their role was to be runners or listeners uh, for patients and to kind of just be hands-on whatever the staff needed. Um, and a lot of these people had never been in an ICU before. So I think it was definitely eye-opening for them. Um, our pharmacy paired up with adult colleagues. Um, so there was one adult and one PD pharmacist that covered our unit to give them the support that they needed. We also had um, hospital-wide teams that were implemented that were a great support. Um, there was the COBRA team that was a team that came and just put in lines. They put in central lines, they put in A lines. Um, we had a proning team that came around, um, a team that would intubate. We had peer support. Um, there was an ICU support team that you could call and a team that um, allocated resources. Um, so I think during all this, you know, it, is, it was important for leadership to be present all the time. And 
It was important for staff during this period of uncertainty to know that they had leadership who was there and they were listening, advocating, um, preparing them, supporting them and caring for them. You know, it was important for us to be transparent and to make sure that they knew what was coming their way and that they had leadership that was advocating for them and looking out uh, for their well-being. The relationships that formed during this time was amazing. Um, the combination of the PICU and the adult general care nurses was amazing to watch and really created bonds among these staff. Um, one of the things that also benef benefited us, I think, was that the PICU team remained intact. They stayed in their own unit with the team that they were accustomed to working with. And even though there was added staff in a different patient population, I think this provided great comfort to our PICU team. And then the general care nurses that came to us also came as a group. So they came um, together as a team, knowing other people. So I think for them, that was also being in a different environment, a comfort. One of the things that we did was huddles. Um, we would in the morning and in the evening have a huddle with nursing, physicians, respiratory, pharmacy, and twice a day we would go over any new information, education, and introductions. And I think the introductions were really important to just create a new team and to establish what everyone's roles were and what they were comfortable with. And we all had name tags on and where we came from and what our roles were. And it also provided constant um, information to be communicated and two-way communication so people could express their concerns to us. We also were very fortunate enough to have one of our PD psychiatrists who in the beginning was told to Zoom with the team and knew that that would not be possible. So she started doing um, weekly rounds and would just walk around the unit and just provide support um, to the staff to express concerns and feelings. Um, and everyone, it was a just a comfort for to see her walk in. And again, being part of the bio threats team um, really, I think, prepared us for this with relationships and just being comfortable um, with donning and doffing. So one of the things with pediatrics is family-centered care, you know, is the core of what we do. And in the beginning, I think the staff were scared and worried about the pathophysiology and the care we were going to provide, and that we would not be able to provide the level of care we were used to. So I think the learning curve was steep for the staff, and they expressed how in the beginning they had to focus on the pathophysiology and had to remove themselves from that normal mental mode of the family-centered care that we usually provide. Um, but it was amazing. I want to say like a week and a half or two weeks into caring for these adult COVID patients, there was a shift um, with staff that they really wanted to bring family-centered care back into the forefront of their practice. And the nurses felt increasingly comfortable with the patient care and wanted to know who these patients were and their families. Um, I think the patients who came to the PICU received amazing care and they also received that extra pediatric, um, you know, little that we give to our patients. And these were some of the things that, that some of our um, staff started doing. Staffs, children started doing artwork that we posted all around the unit. Um, we had pictures of the families around um, and the getting to know me posters. I think it was also important to just Mass General did an amazing job at supporting us at the hospital wide level. Um, you know, we always had PPE. It may have changed frequently, but we always had PPE. They reduced the amount of visitors that were there. They provided hotels and parking for staff, child care. Um, they created a grocery store in the cafeteria with essential supplies. So people that were here um, with all the shortages didn't feel like they had to get out, that they could go downstairs and receive that. So I think our lessons learned was success depends on collaboration and communications at all levels, um, that there's complete transparency and honesty around what is going on across the hospital um, to engender our trust, that you can't anticipate every challenge, new ones are every day, but each of us is not alone and we walk through this together. 
staff are not only concerned about themselves, but they were also scared about their families and a loss of what we knew and what we were comfortable doing. Um, pediatrics is centered around family-centered care, and we felt indirectly we were still caring for our pediatric patients, taking care of their parents and grandparents um, as the pediatric patients were waiting for them to safely return home. Staff had a tremendous sense of pride knowing that we came to the call and we stepped up and put us outside our comfort zone, but we did it and we did it well. Um, and I think we all agree that we'll be better clinicians um, because of this. Critical care principles are no different. Our relationship with our adult colleagues was strengthened and we learned a tremendous amount from them. Um, our bio threats preparation was incredibly important to our success. Um, and we mourn the loss of our PICU and our pediatric patients, but it felt good to assist our adult colleagues and patients and played a critical role during this pandemic. And so now I would like to turn it over to Stacy and Amy. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, we'd like to thank, start by thanking NETEC for organizing this and inviting us to speak. My name is Amy Bachman. I'm a hospital physician and a physician advisor for case management and also assist with post-acute care issues at Mass General Hospital. I was a co-medical director at Boston Hope Field Hospital. And I am Stacy Hutton Johnson. I am an associate executive director for professional practice at Atrius Health. And during my time at Boston Hope, I was the chief nurse officer there. So we'll start by giving a brief overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll describe some background and the organizational structure. We'll talk about the clinical workforce focusing first on nursing and then on providers. We'll talk about some challenges and then we'll close by describing some lessons learned. Boston Hope was commissioned as part of the response from the state of Massachusetts to address a real shortage of post-acute care beds. As you know, uh, COVID has really decimated skilled nursing facilities. And during the surge in the spring, many closed to admissions and um, created a real uh, flow problem for hospitals. And so as a collaboration between the state and the city of Boston, as well as several healthcare organizations led by Mass General Brigham, but also including Atrius Health, Beth Israel Deaconess, excuse me, and uh, several nonprofit organizations and veterans organizations. There was a thousand beds total, but divided into two sides. There were 500 beds on the post-acute care side, and this was managed by Mass General Brigham. And another side was 500 respite beds for undomiciled patients. And this was managed by Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. Today, we'll be talking about the post-acute care facility. Amazingly, Boston Hope was assembled in nine days at the Boston Convention Center. And this included copper piping for oxygen. And we used an incident command structure. This is a picture of Boston Hope in the early stages. And um, it's very impressive. And I think this picture is really helpful in understanding some of the logistical challenges that we had to deal with. I'd like to hand things over to Stacy, who will describe our incident command. This org chart highlights for you a brief overview of our clinical leadership structure at Boston Hope. But as Amy mentioned, uh, above this and overarching, we did have an incident command team. Our commander in charge was uh, a military general. And then there were three others sort of really taking point on that leadership team. One military deputy commander, and then two clinical co-directors, one from nursing and one physician lead. And that's where the co-directors pick up here. As you can see below those co-directors, we had uh, a few core leadership lines. We did have a military unit that was deployed to us, a uh, chief medical officer, myself as the CNO, and then a chief of clinical operations with reporting lines below those. So the admissions criteria at Boston Hope uh, we really came together through rigorous dialogue as a multidisciplinary team with close partnership with admitting colleagues who were redeployed to Boston Hope with expertise in this area. You can see what was within scope and some of our exclusion criteria. 
this was really continually refined throughout the time at Boston Hope with that multidisciplinary team with real mindfulness and an eye towards the safety of the environment uh, being so unique in a, a convention center environment and uh, the equipment and supplies that we had to ensure safe, high quality patient care. Highly complex referrals uh, would be made by a case-by-case -case basis with physician review and in collaboration uh, with nursing leadership. So the nursing workforce recruitment and some structure. Uh, the nurses that showed up at Boston Hope who raised their hand to come answer this call came from vastly differing clinical backgrounds, as you might imagine. We had school nurses uh, with school shut down. We had retired nurses. We had nurses coming from all over the country uh, to answer this call. We will talk a little bit more about the military reserve nurses briefly, um, but we did have ambulatory nurses come, new graduate and student nurses um, through emergency executive order from the governor. We were able to have graduate nurses practicing as nurses at Boston Hope. Um, and we did not have a lot of acute care nurses coming, as you can imagine, they were all um, very busy and in high demand, as we just heard from our colleagues in the PICU. The, acute, the nurses that we had come with acute care ICU experience, many of them had moved into um, advanced practice roles and ambulatory clinics, uh, but did have some hospital background and training. We also recruited support staff and uh, nurses aides were on our team and unit secretaries, uh, which proved to be some of the most very challenging positions to be filled. Um, and then the leadership structure that we put in place, uh, along with myself, we had two nursing directors that were part of the team who were critical to the success of the leadership. We did have two to three nurse educators as was said earlier, the education and training was ongoing and a moving target. Uh, and then there was a resource or charge nurse on each pod for each shift. Did want to highlight briefly three uh, innovative staffing models for nursing that we utilized at Boston Hope. We, as I mentioned previously, the ability to use graduate nurses, so people who had completed the nurse training but yet did not have the chance to sit for their boards uh, because of the COVID pandemic, were able to practice with us at Boston Hope. And it became uh, necessary to establish an appropriate ratio of newer nurses that didn't have experience uh, to our experienced staff so that we could support them and care for them um, during this time. We also engaged with the local school of nursing to staff one of our units with a student nurse pod. So on this unit, we would have six to eight nursing students who are in their final semester. We have one faculty member either at the RN or MSN level of practice and then two Boston Hope nurses to care for all of the patients on that pod. And finally, we did have uh, the, the military reserve unit that was deployed, ran their own unit 24-7 um, and shared a wealth of expertise and knowledge. Uh, they certainly have uh, a lot of experience in setting up field hospitals and these sort of uh, rapid establishment of the environment and the team. So there was a lot of sharing of best practices back and forth. In addition, there was a real integration they were not separate uh, and having a different set of expectations for their clinical care and teaming. They really integrated seamlessly with all of the other pods. Uh, and it was real, one of the real pleasures um, of working at Hope. So the onboarding and support, everyone who came to Boston Hope uh, did receive a central orientation overview. That was an hour and a half offered every single day. We were running orientation as we were quickly bringing people on. Um, and then there was web-based training. So depending on the role group, uh, that would vary. For the nurses, then in addition, they got one day of a precepted experience with a nurse on the unit. Uh, we did develop a checklist of some of the core skills and especially for those newly graduated nurses or graduate nurses, we identified some core skills that we wanted to have validated. Each unit was run by uh, with a resource nurse 
to handle day-to-day -day operations. And then coll they collaborated very closely with our MD team leads. Establishing a learning culture was really critical uh, to being successful here. Making sure everyone felt safe to speak up and say when they were in over their head. Um, and for some of our graduate nurses, uh, when they did uh, demonstrate those core skill validations, if they felt like they um, could not safely provide that care, they were offered a, a nurse's aid position instead at Boston Hope. So just a quick nod to the leadership and staff empowerment. I think one of our key lessons learned was it was most effective to balance the incident command system of quickly needing to make decisions in a command control sort of environment and very rapidly get to good decision making with what we know from evidence-based leadership practices from our magnet model. So to that end, and similar to what some of our PICU colleagues already said, really focused on staff empowerment and support. So either myself and or the nurse directors were there at change of shift for those huddles uh, to hear issues from overnight and for the day and to rapidly engage staff in identifying any failure points, supplies missing, equipment that wasn't working, processes that were broken. So we really could have rapid resolution of those issues, but coming directly from the voice of the front line. Uh, we continually reviewed and refined the admission criteria, as we already said. We did implement a safety reporting system. Uh, so again, during huddles daily with leadership, those could be reviewed um, and any issues could be identified. One example was we found the rolling beds that were deployed to the convention center for us were a contributing factor to falls. Um, and quickly were able to engage a group of staff nurses to problem solve this switch out the beds and really um, rapidly decrease the fall rate. And finally, um, did provide a weekly update from myself, giving some reflections uh, uh, to all the nurses and the support staff around what we had been hearing from them about their needs and the failure points and what had been done to address those. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to Amy. Thanks, Stacey. So overall, we onboarded 124 physicians and APPs. We did this quickly um, with emergency credentialing and privilege processes. So within two to three days, we could get somebody onboarded. The training happened quickly as well. This was provided in um, a two hour session, um, group session, and then a one day orientation with someone on the floor. In general, um, we had um, mostly generalists, so internal medicine or family medicine providers, but we also had a lot of specialists, including surgeons, anesthesiologists, dermatology, and pediatrics. Scheduling was done about a week in advance, and this was to allow for dynamic changes in our patient census. We used a team-based care model based on the pods, as Stacy alluded to, and these were led by uh, physician team leads and this allowed for level setting. So we had, similar to Stacy, a mixed group of providers with different backgrounds and different skill sets. And this way we could balance that. We also had very generous staffing ratio. So four to five patients per provider. And this was really important for allowing for both on the job training, as well as just balancing clinical knowledge. And at peak census, we had about 100 patients. We were fortunate to have many ancillary services. So um, this is many things, I'll just highlight a few important ones. We had an acute care physician available 24 seven. And this was important um, because many of our staff were not acute care trained. And to have a physician available to troubleshoot complicated patients and discuss transfer was really important. And this physician was also available in the need to run any codes. We did have a negative pressure code room available for that. We had physical therapists, occupational therapists, and SLP. This was uh, a post-acute care facility. Um, and we were able to provide services um, twice a day, actually, all days of the week. We had mental health, respiratory therapists. These were in very hard demand at the time. And actually, because of the military task force, we were able to have two uh, respiratory therapists that were really integral to our team. We had 11 case managers, and we also had infection control from one of the local hospitals. We had pharmacy available, um, a 24-7 pharmacist on site, 
and then a limited on-site formulary for emergency medications. And then importantly, since the convention center didn't, um, because of limitations to that, we obtained pharmacy medications from a local CVS and these were delivered twice a day. So on admissions, patients came, were required to come with a three day supply of medications to kind of facilitate the need to order these from um, a pharmacy offsite. We also had laboratories done offsite at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And this was, um, again, um, we selected 67 labs based on um, what um, is typically ordered in a post-acute care facility. So we had COVID PCR, and this was also uh, facilitated with couriers delivering labs three times a day. We did have an on-site ISAT available and ended up actually just not um, using it because of maintenance difficulties. And then because we found that many of our patients were Spanish speaking, and there were a lot of difficulties with using an interpreter through the phone because of N95s and um, the noisiness of the convention center, we ended up having a program that had been launched at some of the hospitals um, where they embed Spanish speaking clinicians onto the teams. And that was really uh, important and helpful. We had x-ray, we had many uh, subspecialty consults available virtually, and then we had a wellness program for both patients and staff. There were many different huddles, but these are some key ones for uh, our workflows. There was a daily critical care huddle led by the acute care physician and the code team. We had a daily clinical and operations leadership meeting at 8 a.m. On the floors, there was a daily unit huddle led by the physician team lead to review overnight events and workflow issues. And then twice a week, there were discharge huddles led by case management to um, bring together the team to talk about discharge planning. Overall, we had the privilege of taking care of 394 patients over seven weeks. These were mostly referred from local academic medical centers. They stayed on average about eight days. Our patient population was mostly male, an average age of 57. 31% were 65 and older. And I'll just point out this is a, a lower age and different demographic than typically you would see in a skilled nursing facility. Patients were on six medications and had about five active medical issues. And there was a high burden of mental health. Um, consultation. Luckily, we did not have any intubations or cardiopulmonary arrests or patient deaths. We did have 26 unplanned transfers to the emergency room, so a readmission rate of around 6%. And these were, uh, interestingly, for not related to COVID or respiratory issues, but more for chest pain, high blood pressure, altered mental status were the main um, clinical issues. Uh, nearly all patients were discharged home or to a shelter, and just 11 went to another post-acute care facility, and seven left AMA. And as I noted earlier, um, many of our patients did not speak English, and so uh, we tried to accommodate that. And then we had limited race demographics, so only for 70% of patients. Um, and um, again, we noted um, we had a, a large percentage of patients of color. I'll hand things back over to Stacy. Thanks, Amy. Um, so as I think some of these uh, pictures denote, we really uh, had the privilege of caring for not just our, our patients, but of one another. And I think the, the morale and the spirits of the people who showed up to care for patients and care for one another uh, at, at Boston Hope was um, a really moving experience for, for all the, the people involved. And this picture here to the left is depicting one of our last patients being discharged from Boston Hope. So uh, some of the lessons learned and, and challenges uh, at Boston Hope, uh, th there were many and we, we could spend a lot of time um, sharing all of those, but there were certainly a lot of logistical complexity being in a, a convention center from things as simple to concrete floors, uh, to bathrooms that were uh, football length distance away from where patients were, um, and food services, uh, individuals that were not accustomed to uh, being able to fulfill food orders 
uh, or patient care diets, right? So there, there were a lot of complexities related to that. Um, and as Amy referred to earlier, it was a very rapid time frame uh, within nine days to go from an empty convention center to admitting our first patient. Uh, so when we did admit our first patient, we were still um, you know, ironing out many of the logistics and getting supplies in as patients were beginning to arrive. For the workforce perspective, um, we needed to stay very agile and nimble about both our structure uh, and leveraging the assets of the people who were raising their hand and willing and able to come serve at Boston Hope. We established you know, that rapid teaming and support uh, by, by showing up. I think uh, the PICU team spoke to that very clearly as well. The value of the leadership um, being willing to show up at the front line um, and support the people uh, providing the care as this is unfolding very rapidly. We had very vulnerable populations and underserved populations uh, that we needed to adapt to and make sure uh, that our discharge rounds and uh, the services we were providing to our patients while at Hope were in best service to those patient populations. And again, I think all of the interdisciplinary leadership really showed up with this commitment to balancing, doing really effective, very rapid cycle decision-making and change management with the voice and partnership uh, of the staff all along the way. So again, a couple last lessons learned here. The, the partnership that we experienced with both the Massachusetts state and city government, the military individuals that um, arrived and were deployed to HOPE, as long as with the uh, local healthcare organizations, um, was very essential for the logistical support and, and pulling this off. The, the network of um, partners, now MGB, to be able to leverage um, those relationships across the city was really um, instrumental to this success. Uh, we had a clearly defined mission uh, and the leadership was critical for rapidly scaling this and problem solving um, and approaching every problem we were encountering with a, yes, we can do this, let's figure out how. Uh, and then lastly, the dynamic workflows uh, again, required very clear communication pathways uh, that were repeated over and over again. Uh, the clinical operations expertise that was deployed, um, and again, very highly adaptable staff, staff who were um, willing to be pushing themselves and their skills, um, but speaking up and asking for help when they needed it from other staff members. And these are just uh, a few resources that are going to be made available to you, including um, my contact information, as well as Amy's, uh, with a, a couple of articles that have come out about our work at Boston Hope. And now uh, I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues, uh, Koi and Syra. Hi, uh, thank you for the, uh, the, um, the transition. Um, this is uh, my name is Koi Long. I'm the chief medical officer of, of Post Acute Care. Hi, and I'm Sarah Madad. I'm the senior director of New York City Health and Hospital um, System. My special so pathogens program. Thank you. And we we want to thank NITEC for uh, inviting us and allowing us to present on New York City Health and Hospitals' experience with uh, alternate care sites during the first wave of COVID in New York City. So uh, quickly, the objectives of the presentation are to provide an overview of the New York City Health and Hospitals alternate care site, describe operational and administrative considerations, uh, describe enhanced infection prevention and contr control strategies. Uh, and as we progress through the presentation, I will refer to New York City Health and Hospitals as HNH and Roosevelt Island Medical Center as RIMSI. So uh, New York City Health and Hospital is the largest public health system in the United States. The uh, health system is comprised of three service lines, uh, the acute hospitals, post-acute care, and also ambulatory care. The inpatient footprint consists of 11 acute hospitals, one long-term acute care hospitals, and uh, five skilled nursing facilities. Um, two, uh, collectively, uh, there consists of uh, 6,684 staff beds, 
Uh, annually, we provide 4.4 million clinic visits and then also 1.1 million ED visits. Prior to the peak of the COVID uh, pandemic, H&H uh, took many steps to create patient capacity and uh, to direct patient overflow. The acute hospitals created surge in flex spaces along with system level loading practices. Uh, there were non-traditional healthcare spaces that were created uh, in hotel programs and also surge hospitals. This presentation focuses, focuses on two alternate care sites Roosevelt Island Medical Center and Billie Jean King. Before I describe Billie Jean King and Rimsey, I want to depict the patient uh, flow of uh, surge patients coming from the 11 hospitals. Each surge site had a set of criteria that guided the patient selection. Uh, the hospital staff were trained on the various criteria and uh, within the hospitals, referrals can come from the ER, med surge and ICU. From there, the patient can go to any uh, of these sites, which uh, are listed here. Uh, hotel, Rimsey, uh, BJK, skilled nursing facilities, or the LTAC, and then uh, we hope eventually home. So um, to describe Rimsey, uh, this was a 350 bed surge facility located in Manhattan, New York. The beds were set up in unoccupied space of an existing skilled nursing facility. Even though the location was a healthcare facility, the surge location did not have an ER, an ICU, an operating room, or radiology suite. Uh, the setup time uh, accounting for planning uh, was around three weeks, and the nearest hospital located to this uh, search site uh, was two and a half miles away. So uh, Billie Jean King uh, was a 470-bed search space located in Queens, New York. This effort was a partnership involving uh, New York City Health and Hospitals, along with the Department of Design and Construction and the Office of Emergency Management. This location uh, located in a tennis stadium also did not include an ER, an ICU, an operating room, or a radiology suite. The setup time was also around three weeks and the nearest hospital there was three miles away. So the staffing component was very, very important. Um, and that, that was a, um, uh, one of the uh, major uh, bulk of work. Uh, the majority of the staff uh, were recruited through multiple uh, temp agencies. The onboarding was very challenging. Um, each temp agency wanted to use their uh, own institutional forms and documents for credentialing. Uh, this request uh, was very difficult to accommodate uh, with uh, our system's existing medical and professional affairs and HR policies. So identifying this uh, early on as a barrier um, h, &H uh, onboarding of surge staff was then centralized and trimmed down to three main activities, uh, which consisted of an HR clearance for licensed and non-licensed staff, IT onboarding, and also disaster privileging. These activities uh, could occur independent of each other and also had differing lead time for uh, completion. So knowing when a staff was fully cleared um, was hard to track and report what the volume of staff was being, uh, that was being processed. So working towards a more uh, transparent process an onboarding liaison role was created to oversee and to coordinate uh, parallel activities. Um, this helped reduce the overall wait time uh, to start and also improved communication uh, to external tent agencies and also the accepting uh, search sites. So on the slide, you, you can get a sense, uh, you get an idea of the types of staff, uh, the categories of staff uh, that we uh, really needed to be efficient um, uh, with the onboarding process. So uh, when the, um, the activity at the surge site uh, was teetering down, uh, there was an opportunity to reassign uh, these uh, available staff to the hospitals where uh, they were busier. And, and um, in, in that uh, segment, uh, we also encountered uh, the same issues with um, with onboarding. So with everything going on, uh, this, this, this part was very difficult to perfect um, and make uh, more efficient. So um, related to uh, leadership, uh, we organized the leadership into um, uh, three core uh, groups. Uh, there was uh, administration, operations, medical, uh, nursing. Uh, for uh, Rimsey and Billie Jean King, there was site leadership and management 
um, uh, representing all levels. Uh, RIMSI had a smaller, uh, smaller leadership team uh, that we recruited internally. Uh, Billie Jean King, uh, leadership and management staff, was a, a, a little fuller. Um, this was provided by a contracted group. Uh, the general challenge in ensuring quality and patient safety from a management point of view was really balancing industry standards and practices with the scope of practice uh, for a licensed worker uh, with existing organizational policy and procedures. Uh, so, you know, as we experienced it, uh, there was a lot of training um, and level setting uh, on the fly. So in setting up Rimsey and Billie Jean King, we had a vision that the sites could effectively decompress surge overflow of hospitals by accepting low to mid acuity med surge type patients which are patients who were expected to fully recover in a short period of time, or those who uh, could decompensate where the staff uh, could safely respond to the change of condition without sending the patient back to the main hospital. So beyond recruiting qualified staff, there was a lot of work to establish core clinical services and capabilities. We were able to leverage existing vendor relationships and also to scale internal resources to accomplish this. Uh, the on-site pharmacy services were provided through an existing pharmacy partner of H&H uh, &H skilled nursing facility. The surge site could provide IV push meds and also infusion medications. This included control and non-control medications, equip equipping the sites with mobile imaging with x-ray and ultrasound modalities were established through a combination of approaches. RIMSI's imaging was provided through an established vendor relationship Billie Jean King uh, imaging was covered through Elmhurst Hospital inpatient radiology team reading remotely. A comprehensive menu of lab tests was uh, processed by joint venture uh, relationship. Uh, in addition to that, there was point of care lab testing uh, available on site. Uh, Epic was the EMR that we used at both sites. Um, this was helpful in that it assisted um, keeping clinical workflow standard among uh, changing clinical staff. Um, at RIMSI, we were able to set up a dedicated unit for telemetry, continuous cardiac monitoring, and uh, were able to bridge subspecialty services through use of telemedicine. So smaller points that I would like to make on this slide relates to dietary services and medical gases. In order to take medically complex patients, the search site would need to accommodate a range of food and liquid consistency. The ability to safely swallow can change depending on the general condition of the patient. In terms of oxygen supplementation, uh, portable O2 tanks were not sufficient to provide around the clock oxygen needs and for more advanced forms of oxygen delivery beyond a nasal cannula. Rimsey used um, O2 uh, concentrators primarily at Billie Jean King, uh, being that this was uh, at a tennis stadium a 9,000 gallon medical oxygen tank, as well as a 3,000 gallon reserve tank and vaporizer uh, were installed uh, on site at the National Stadium. So uh, in looking at this uh, as a system uh, and, and how, how to uh, have it fit into the care continuum, the, uh, the surge bed capacity was monitored on a system dashboard um, initially, the referral uh, were coming in, uh, you know, individually uh, from each hospital, but the various sites that I mentioned, ER, ICU, uh, med search floor, um, this became uh, rapidly uh, very overwhelming to decide uh, whether or not a patient was appropriate for an alternate care site. Um, eventually, we did centralize the process to create a smoother placement of surge patients. So Rimsey uh, and Billie Jean King was covered by a central referral system that also directed patient flow uh, to the hotel program, the skilled nursing facility, and the uh, long-term acute care hospital from the main uh, from the main hospitals. So the uh, central referral system received referrals from 11 hospitals within uh, hospitals. The um, uh, central referral intake process was useful in that it could accommodate. Um, criteria is changing without confusing a uh, clinical staff that was working uh, uh, closely on the unit uh, and with the patient. Um, equipping the uh, alternate uh, care sites with cap uh, clinical capabilities and guiding patient flow uh, was half of the work 
uh, we were dealing with a novel, highly contagious disease. Uh, Dr. Syra Madad will present on infection prevention control strategies and planning that built the confidence in staff to safely care for patients with COVID-19. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit upon the enhanced infection prevention control strategies that have been implemented in these two alternate care sites. So I think for starting off, you know, since these are non-traditional environments, it was really, really important to, you know, um, maintain and augment the infection control um, strategies that were implemented in these two particular sites. And so we took into consideration the physical and the logistical and the operational um, aspects within the context of infection prevention and control, uh, along with the lens of caring for patients, uh, as Dr. Long mentioned, low to mid acuity, um, and then potentially increasing acuity as needed. So with that, um, the special pathogens team developed a template that we used for all the different alternate care sites. So both with um, Brimsey and BJK, but then we also used a, a very similar template for infection prevention and control environmental walkthroughs for the hotels. And so this is just giving you a, a, a sample of what we were using. And so let me just kind of give you a high level walkthrough of some of the considerations that we were looking at that were operationalized um, at these alternate care sites. So first, when we talk about the physical layout and the floor plan, we were looking at and ensuring that there were physical separation and barriers between patients, um, looking at the patient transport within the facility and having dedicated routes. So for example, just to, you know, an individual that needs to use the restroom uh, in, you know, the BJK, which was converted, um, you know, for patient care um, and having the restrooms kind of outside the main auditorium, having a, a pre-planned route, if you will. Um, also looking at staff break areas and making sure that they were separate, uh, separate areas for donning and doffing, making sure that there was another area for cleaning and disinfecting uh, reused equipment like eye protection that was going to be reused for the next shift, making sure there was a dedicated space for medication and supply storage, uh, dirty and clean utility areas, and then also very much looking at some of the engineering controls that were implemented from the physical layout and floor plan. So making sure that there was, for example, unidirectional flow. Um, environmental services was another really big thing. We were making sure that uh, was up and running in these alternate care sites. So something as you know, uh, simple as regular and routine uh, cleaning and disinfection, uh, trash and medical waste removal, looking at some of the spill cleanup plans, and ensuring there were dedicated spaces for reprocessing uh, re re uh, any reusable uh, medical equipment and supplies. Um, clinical operations, you heard Dr. Long, uh, you know, provide an overview of some of the um, staffing that was um, you know, implemented in these alternate care sites, but also making sure that we had job specific infection prevention control training ongoing, um, ongoing surveillance and monitoring, and then having accessible uh, supplies um, where uh, staffing were aware of where to, where to get uh, these equipment and supplies as needed. So these dedicated spaces and making sure that they were aware of where to get it. Um, and then I'm going to show you uh, in another slide, some of the areas for donning and doffing um, and the zones that were created in a moment. And then lastly, you know, when we talk about external services like housekeeping, linen management, food services, pharmacy labs, all of these services have dedicated uh, spe you know, specific areas within these alternate care sites. Um, and there was very much meticulous planning to prevent any cross-contamination uh, from occurring. So these are just some images of signages that um, were developed and put in these alternate care sites. And I think, you know, one of the big things is as simple as a signage may be, these are really important visual cues um, for uh, staff and along with just, you know, patients um, uh, that are in this particular facility and vendors. And so we had multiple different types of signages from physical distancing and workplace etiquette, for example, break room etiquette to just preventing cross-contamination having reminder slides and making sure no PPE in this particular area, removing PPE before going into, you know, uh, one area from another, for example, um, making sure that uh, individuals are aware of continuously, you know, um, uh, doing hand hygiene and the like. So a lot of different signages were developed for these alternate care sites that were posted very strategically um, throughout uh, these locations. And then in this slide, um, this is how we 
um, operationalized, for example, the donning and doffing areas, they were clearly marked uh, within these zones. And so in the image on the left, you're seeing inside the auditorium where patient care was uh, occurring and you see a red line um, that's really uh, kind of considered the hot zone. If you look at the right pic the picture um, on the right or right next to it, outside the, um, the main clinical care area was the, the doffing area. And you had chairs and um, tape um, around this area. And you know that uh, this is, for example, the, the ante room. And then you had dedicated spaces for donning and doffing. You also had checklists that were posted um, outside this particular area. There were tables set up um, if staff were doing extended use for reuse of PPE. So they knew where to hang the PPE and how to clean and disinfect pre before donning and doffing. So all of this was, um, you know, meticulously planned and operationalized uh, by Dr. Long's team. And we just went in and made sure that uh, things were, were working properly and that we had these plans um, in place and kind of essentially doing audits um, on an ongoing basis. All right, and with that, uh, I will hand it back. Thanks, Syra. Thanks so much, everybody. Those are three really great examples of alternate care sites and lessons learned um, there as well. So I hope you're able to take those back. We do have a couple questions, um, and I'm going to try to route those to the appropriate individuals. Um, the first one is for Mass General. Um, I think you answered it in the Q&A, but a couple people put a thumbs up on it, and I'm not sure they saw the response. So if you could just go ahead and tell the group um, about where you put your pediatric patients that would usually have been admitted to that pediatric ICU that you used, um, where were those patients? Sure. Hi, this is Ryan from Master. I'll pick you. Um, you know, coming into the surge, we we're asked by our hospital leadership to try to uh, curtail any uh, elective surgical medical procedures, et cetera, and uh, reduce the admissions of pediatric patients so that we can join forces with our adult colleagues and uh, provide care for adult COVID patients. So our numbers actually dwindled down to basically just a handful of patients left in our uh, pick you, and in fact, we were down to two as we were as we were admitting adults in real time. And one of them went home, and one of them went to Boston Children's Hospital. And prior to that, patients that might have otherwise come to us were diverted to either Boston Children's or Tufts um, or some of the other uh, hospitals. We were we're in one of those uh, cities where there are multiple pediatric providers here. Um, and our pediatric leadership was in constant communication with the pediatric leadership in those respective institutions. And they were always, they were in constant communication regarding movement of patients, um, et cetera. So it was a highly collaborative effort across the city, actually. Great and very fortunate that your admission rates were down a little bit so that you could accommodate those patients. Yep. Um, for those patients that you did accept while you're live on here, <laughs> for those patients you did accept, those adult patients, were there any guardrails that your institution put in place about what patients you would accept and wouldn't accept, or were you just accepting what came to you? You mean with regards to the adult patients that came to our unit? Yes. Yes, the question is uh, about adult patients. Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, during that time, we were pretty specific our, we did have a little bit of guardrails. We had asked if it's possible, because we don't typically take care of adults, if it's possible if we could take care of adults who are truly COVID-19 and ARDS, respiratory failure was fine, uh, but try to minimize the amount of comorbidities in those patient, patients that we typically don't see. So um, congestive heart failure, um, which we do take care of quite often in children, but it's a different type um, than, than seen in adult patients. Um, liver failure, uh, kidney failure, we actually took care of those patients regardless. Um, but we just tried to, if it was possible, um, we were very open to taking any patients that were necessary, but if we could filter out the ones that would have, that had multiple comor comorbidities that were very adult specific, um, and our teams were collaborative collaborating with us to, to determine which, which patients were best for us to take. Great. And the final one was, um, are you still, do you still have adult patients now? And if you don't, are you just on ready or has that phase kind of closed out? We do not. Um, our last adult patient, I think was discharged in May, June. Um, but we actually remained open to adult patients. We never closed. And we had, of course, a, a large surge of MISC 
patients, right, about a week after our last adult uh, left. Um, uh, actually, actually, with, actually within that same week. And um, we remained open and um, we are uh, open to taking adult patients now. The process for that though might be different. We, uh, our hospital leadership tells us that they will not ask us to curtail um, uh, pediatric uh, admissions. And if we have to, we might be a split unit half adult, half uh, pediatric, yeah. Constantly acting and adjusting because this whole pandemic continues. But, well, thank you very Correct. much. I'm gonna move on to a couple questions <laughs> for the Boston Hope facility. Um, you mentioned a couple of times that you had patients that needed to be admitted into a actual hospital facility. Could you talk about a little bit how that transport was coordinated? Did you have an ambulance on standby or what did that process look like? So just to clarify, this is Amy. The question was about transfers to outside facilities back to hospitals. Yes, the, if the patient um, was deteriorating or you mentioned, I think it was 26 or something, patients had to go back to the hospital for multiple reasons, how you guys kind of coordinated that transport. Got it. So um, as I mentioned, we were lucky in that we had a, a an acute care physician on site 24 seven to kind of help evaluate for any um, critical changes. Um, and if that patient needed to be sent out and couldn't be managed uh, safely there, we did have a four bed unit observation um, for patients that were a little bit higher level of acuity. So increasing O2 requirement or um, things that could kind of be watched for a little bit. But if someone clearly needed to be worked up quickly like for chest pain or for hypertensive, um, urgency, we would send those patients out. Um, we had a, uh, an ambulance on site um, that was just available. And so we would use that. And then depending on sort of the acuity of the situation and where the patient had come from, um, we would uh, send the patient um, to either the Brigham, which was I think the closest hospital <clears throat> or um, Mass General. Um, depending on um, just geography and, and clinical acuity. So that was um, a decision that was made in real time by the team taking care of the patient. Perfect, thank you. Um, and since your site was so big, a question came through of, you mentioned a lot of logistics and planning that came into it and you were able to stand it up fairly quickly. For someone who's trying to do that currently, where do you recommend that they start? Um, to have a good process. Um, this is Stacy. I can I can start on that one, Amy, and then chime in. Uh, I think the success of Boston Hope really, and the speed with which it was able to be put up, was really, really critical. That um, both the state and local city officials were in total and complete alignment with um, the MGB leadership and Ensign Command team that was put together. So there was a real commitment at that sort of executive and state level um, to resource this and, and make it happen. Um, without that sort of mobilization and support, I think it, it, it would have been nearly impossible um, to do it in such short order. Exactly. So the National Guard was present and very helpful, for example, with just a lot of the logistics. MGV provided a lot of the clinical resources, but a lot of the, you know, the security, the actual um, supplies were provided by the, the government. Um, and the collaboration was really key. And it wasn't just MGV, honestly. It was actually several organizations um, were, um, were incredibly helpful. Quite the team effort, I am sure. <laughs> yes. Um, and then <laughs> lastly, for Boston Hope, there's one other question. Um, Judith would like to know for your site in particular, how were patients billed and um, how was your site funded? That's a great question. So um, it was paid for. It was a combination of, um, so resources, like I said, came from 
the state, the city, and then MGB, as I understand, um, fronted a lot of the costs as well and has applied for um, reimbursement, I think, under one of the emergency um, relief programs under FEMA, I think. Um, and just going back to the other question, I was just thinking, you know, the um, the team that did a lot of the planning used um, FEMA resources as well as some um, internal documents that they had. A lot of them had experience with sort of disaster response. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you both. Um, two questions for our New York colleagues. Um, Michael asked if you could speak to a little bit about your infection rate among providers in your alternate care site. Sure, uh, I can speak on that. Um, for uh, Billy Jean King, uh, I know that number is zero. I believe uh, at Rimsey it would be zero or it would be fairly low. That wasn't uh, an issue that uh, reared up among the uh, the staff that were there. Great, thank you. And um, I'll just pitch it back to Boston Hope to see if they had any um, different percentages there. Yeah, this is Stacy. It was it was very similar. I, I apologize. I don't actually have uh, the exact statistics at my fingertips, um, but it was. Uh, a very minimal issue for us as well. There were um, a couple of um, staff who became positive during their time there, but um, those cases when they were investigated um, did look like they might be community acquired or elsewhere. Um, so there were not like attributable cases necessarily to care at Hope. Awesome. And then the last question I'm gonna ask um, is to our New York colleagues. Um, Dr. Long, you mentioned uh, the training that was necessary for some of the staff due to the environment and circumstances. Could you talk a little bit about what that training looked like and who provided that training? Uh, sure. So uh, because we were covering two surge sites, um, the IT training was a big one. Uh, that tied everyone's uh, role or clinical, uh, I would say staff members' role. Uh, together. So there was uh, ongoing uh, training programs uh, that was uh, created um, for the, um, the clinical uh, care part. What we did, um, we approached it a little more organically, uh, being that, you know, these were non-traditional uh, uh, healthcare sites for hospitals. Uh, we issued uh, the criteria and the level of uh, capabilities uh, that could be provided there. I think uh, uh, with those as uh, communication tools and training uh, tools, it framed to the, uh, the licensed staff, you know, like physicians, uh, nurses, uh, what, you know, what the realm of care or the scope of care would be. And uh, the biggest part that I uh, feel allowed for a level of autonomy, a uh, decision making through pandemic, um, was to have uh, uh, management and leadership on site. Uh, to answer questions as they come along. Because, you know, obviously things are, you know, you're not working within uh, normal regulatory boundaries. And so, um, you know, to define everything ahead of time, it, it, it may it may have impeded care. So the, uh, the on-site leadership and management was uh, very crucial uh, um, foundationally uh, for the, the staff there as questions came up. Thank you very much. It seems like leadership on site was a very um, common theme between the three um, examples we heard today. Um, but with that, I'm gonna close out our question and answer section. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers today for taking time out of their busy schedule and giving us the valuable information um, that we can hopefully learn from and take back home. Um, just as I close out, we just wanted to let you know that NEEDTECH is here to help. We continue to build resources, develop online education, deliver technical trainings to meet needs of our partners on a daily basis. Again, if you have a question um, related today or not, please feel free to email info at needtech.org and we can have your question answered by our subject matter experts. You're also more than welcome to submit a technical assistance request at needtech.org. We are on social media. Please join us in the conversation. You can join us on Facebook, Twitter. We do have a blog, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Our skill videos are available on YouTube. And then our e-learning center is at courses.needtech.org. Again, at the bottom are other resources that we have. 
I would like to thank everybody for joining today, and I hope that everybody has a safe and happy holidays. Thank you so much.